the good, the bad, the ugly. We're talking the top 15 running backs from 2023 and what we saw from them this season, what that means moving forward, and just recapping the 2023 season a little bit and having some fun doing it. Welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Football Fellows Podcast. My name is Cameron Lawrence, and I am joined by my esteemed host, Mr. Tyler Plath. Tyler, how are we doing on this fine Tuesday, or I guess Wednesday when the people hear it? I'm doing uh, I'm doing all right, doing all right. Just a quick shout out to my guys from the doghouse this weekend where we went up to northern Minnesota and just smoked some, some walleye the whole weekend and stuff, and that was a lot of fun, but I am... I'm still kind of dragging my feet a little bit. There are some early mornings, some late nights, but uh, you know what? There's nothing that gets you back into the swing of things like talking some football. So I'm ready. I'm I'm ready to do it today. Yes, sir. And if you haven't noticed, we are shifting fully to our off season mode. We will have one podcast episode a week on Wednesdays. Lucas was unable to join us today. He will be back next week, and we will have all three of us fellows moving forward. We also only have one YouTube video each week, but the shorts will keep on coming. So make sure to hit that subscribe button. Make sure to turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on any of that. But Tyler, I say we just jump right into it. What do you say? I would agree with you. Yeah, and so just real quick, I want to get your thought five second thoughts. I forgot to ask this right when we started, but we we can't just skip over the playoffs, right? We're football fans. We're football fans. What is what is your biggest takeaway from the playoffs so far? This could, this doesn't have to be fantasy related. Just biggest takeaway from what we've seen so far. Last night, Monday, Bucks win, um, and the Eagles season they started off so hot, and then uh, Buffalo unsurprisingly beat Pittsburgh, but. From from the weekend as a whole, what was your biggest takeaway? My biggest takeaway was how many games were not really close. Mm. Like the only close game we got was the Rams and the Lions. Yeah. Every every other game was an absolute walloping mm. of one team, right? Houston over Cleveland. You had Kansas City over Miami. You had Green Bay over Dallas. And, you, and then you had, I mean... Buffalo Pittsburgh got kind of interesting in the second yeah. half, but like you still felt like Buffalo was still in control of that game. Like, and I think we're, we're going to get some more competitive games because usually that's how it works. You have, mm-hmm. you know, a week of a lot of blowouts. You're going to have the following week be a lot of closer games because all the teams that, that want to move on and stuff. So I, I was kind of surprised by that, but at the same time, I, you know, the teams that won, I'll say this too, I wasn't really surprised by, you know, Mm -hmm. there were the hot, I mean, I think people were like, well, Dallas is the two seed, Uh, but green Bay was arguably like the hottest team in the league. Yeah, they were like, I, it wasn't really that much of a surprise for me. So I, I, I'm glad that this was how wildcard weekend started off because now there is even uh, closer football games to look forward to where you're going to be on the edge of your seed. And, you know, it, it's, it was a good first weekend of playoffs. Yeah, I would agree. And then just thinking like matchups coming up this next week, right? We got Jordan Love and Brock Purdy. You know, I mean, we always, it feels like we're always getting a 49ers Green Bay game. So that's going to be fun. Um, you know, Jer- the Lions Buccaneers game might seem the least exciting, you know, going into it, but knowing those two teams and the way they've been playing, it's going to be a fun matchup. And then on the other side, Mahomes and Josh Allen can't ask for much more than that. And then well, you got the rookie it, going in against Lamar. Yeah. I mean, it's Mahomes going to Buffalo yeah. for the first time ever. Like, yeah. it'll be fun. It'll be, it'll be exciting. I mean, I just can't wait. I, I think for me, the biggest takeaway is just, the quarterbacks yeah. between the two sides, like NFC it's Brock Purdy, Jordan love, Jared Goff and Baker Mayfield and no disrespect to those four. They have all four been playing really, really well. That's why their teams are where they are, but in name value on the other side, you got Lamar uh, Mahomes, Josh Allen, CJ Stroud. And you think of the AFC too next year, Aaron Rodgers will be back. Joe Burrow will be back. Justin Herbert will be right. I mean, you're missing all these guys and on the NFC, like, Kirk Cousins is the one that's going to, you know, and it's just like, <laughs> I, we love Kirk, 
But, I mean, you look at AFC to NFC quarterbacks, it's pretty crazy. But we're here to talk running backs, so we'll get into that. Like I said to start the episode, we're talking the good, the bad, the ugly. So the good, we're going to share one of each from these running backs. The good is, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. Like, it's a highlight. It's what went right this year. The bad is not like a negative, but it's something they disappoint. And the ugly is what went absolutely wrong. We're going to go 15 to 1. Obviously, there's players like spoiler Christian McCaffrey we're not going to spend as much time on because it's you know we don't need a recap you know what went right you know what went wrong with him um but there are other guys we will definitely take a bigger look into so let's start with number 15 Mr. Isaiah Pacheco um this season you know he was pretty good let me pull up I should have had this ready to go let me pull up the stats real quick on each of these guys so I can read them off for you um Isaiah Pacheco had 205 carries, 935 yards, 4.6 yards per carry, added seven touchdowns, 44 receptions on 49 targets for another 244 and two. So a pretty decent season. He averaged 15.3 points per game and only 14 games. Um, And the good for Pacheco is the increase in targets this season. He had 14 last year, 49 this year. um, And just through the receiving game, averaged an extra or added an extra 45 fantasy points to his total. When we came into the year, that was my biggest worry, was that he was going to be back who didn't see a ton of carries, right? I mean, he had 205 in four, 14 games, so he saw more than I thought he was going to. But then the receiving work really took an uptick, which was huge. And let's be honest, there wasn't a ton of negatives for Isaiah, for Ch- Isaiah Pacheco from where you drafted him compared to last year, right? The bad, he missed, he missed one week of the playoffs. You know, you you wanted him there all, every week, but he missed one week. And the ugly is he's still not running a ton of routes. He was 33rd in route participation. Right? You're not you're not seeing exactly, you know, elite running back. This might be his ceiling, but still six, almost 16 points per game from where you draft him is really good. Ty, do you got anything to add on Isaiah Pacheco? No, he was, I. Uh, you know, I could victory lap this because I was kind of knocking on the door a little bit with you, with you boys that I was you like, were. Uh, are we, are we, are we, uh, discounting Isaiah Pacheco a little too much here? Because the thing was like, he was going to be the guy in this backfield and you know, the, the, the usage kind of was a roller coaster a bit because you get some games where he's getting like 17 carries and then you get a game where he has like eight and you're like, well, Mm -hmm. that's not cool. Like I need, I need more consistency out of that. But I mean, the, the other thing that surprised me too, a little bit with all the wide receiver troubles that Kansas city had, right. You know, and that we saw Rishi Rice emerge at the end. Mm-hmm. Part of me wonders like how much of the receiving work comes from that. But then the other yeah. part of it is that like, you see like the jets, like really like incorporate Brees hall into their passing attack and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I, it was curious to me again with the wide receiver struggles and stuff, why Pacheco didn't get that kind of, you know, yeah. uh, you see, or you know, kind of, I I don't know how you would say it, but like it just you were looking for weapons on that Kansas City team, and for I, I we're nitpicking at this point because we are talking about top fifteen running back on the season, mm-hmm. but it was it was a very it was a very peculiar season for Isaiah Pacheco, but one that I think definitely paid off because you 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 drafted yeah. him at the end of the sixth round in your drafts this year, like. That's that's value. That's outperforming your ADP. That's what you want out of really anybody that you draft. Yeah, you were very happy with him if you took him. And I think the biggest thing for the hike in his receiving game is, like you said, they needed him. But then also, Jarek McKinnon just wasn't a thing like he was last year. Right? He only mm-hmm. had 32 catches in 12 games. And so I, I mean, that obviously pays dividends. And I would be shocked if the Chiefs bring in you know, a starting caliber running back next year. I think Pacheco's kind of got this on lock. I think they're going to look for other weapons on the offense at the wide receiver position, if they're going to go offense. Um, But let's transit or let's move on to the running back 14, Tony Pollard. He had 252 carries 1000 yards rushing only four yards per carry added six touchdowns on the ground. Another 55 receptions, 67 targets for 311 yards. Ty, why don't you give us the good, the bad and the ugly on Mr. Tony Pollard, man. I'm really done and tired of talking about Tony Pollard, but I know here we are. (laughs) Um, no, the good for Tony Pollard this year is, you know, just kind of like we all predicted and hoped for, he was going to get 
an absurd amount of touches. He got over 300 touches this year, and he had career highs and receptions and targets. And like I said, you wanted that. You hoped for that at the beginning of the season with no more Zeke. You thought this backfield was going to go to Tony Pollard, and it did, right? And, you know, you had some games where Rico Dowdle probably got too many touches, but you know what? That's that's not my choice. That's Mm -hmm. why I'm sitting behind a camera talking with you people. I'm not on the (laughs) sideline of an NFL game, but um, I think a lot of people would agree, though, there was probably more bad than good when it came to Tony Pollard this year. And maybe Mm -hmm. that's just because of a, you know, because of the hype that he had going into this season. But, you know, Tony Pollard, he had literally half of his games were in the single digits for fantasy points. He only had six touchdowns on the year while still being second in red zone touches for running backs. And mm-hmm. that's, that's just brutal, brutal efficiency. He had the ninth most stuffed runs. He was the 11th worst running back in yards before contact per attempt of yeah. all running backs with 150 carries or more. Like I, we're still trying to figure out exactly like if this season, like if it was Tony Pollard's fault, if it was offensive line fault, Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever, you know, argument you can come up with, but you know, the, the, the worst of the worst when it came, when it comes to Tony Pollard, he had a career low in yards per carry with just four after going 5.3, 4.3, 5.5, 5.2 into four years prior and his lowest in yards per reception with just five and a half after going seven, seven, eight and a half, nine and a half. And it was, again, it was probably the most, one of the more disappointing seasons that we've seen from a running back, because again, you saw how good he was the year before and you got the opportunity that you wanted. And for whatever reason, it just didn't come through. Yeah. He felt almost like the inverse Deandre Swift this year. Yeah, Andre Swift yards before contact was fantastic. You know, he all of his efficiency metrics were up. He had a great line. He had like no red zone touches comparatively, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he did feel kind of like the inverse. It'll be interesting. He is an unrestricted free agent this year. He'll be 27. So it'll be interesting how teams value him this year moving forward, knowing what he did last year, the explosiveness we saw, knowing that, okay, it wasn't great, but he still handled a you know, 200 or 300 touch workload this season. Um, so it'll be very interesting, you know, moving forward on him. Let's talk about a guy who's also in his division, running back 13, Saquon Barkley. And Saquon was interesting this year because I don't think you were happy necessarily with drafting Saquon, but at the same time, he didn't necessarily kill you. You know, um, he was, he kind of felt like a Tony Pollard plus in a way um, this season with like a minor plus he had finished with as a top 13 back in seven is 14 games. So seven of those games were, were nice. He had a, I think it was five top 10 finishes as well, but the bad was on the inverse. On, if he wasn't top 13, he was a single digit in P, uh, PPR formats with five out of his 14 games. And then the ugly, this dude was had a um, significantly lower this season in attempts, yards per carry, targets, receiving yards, rushing yards, and receptions. Um, on the season, he had 247 carries for 962 yards, only averaged 3.9 yards per attempt, had six touchdowns, um, rushing, 41 receptions, 60 targets, 280 yards through the air, and another four touchdowns. So, a lot of it, I think, can be chalked up to the fact that this Giants offense was terrible after looking de- pretty good last year, right? Last year, they could move the ball. This year, um, even when Daniel Jones was in the game, they did not look good. And then, obviously, when he was gone and they were rocking Tommy DeVito, they were rocking Tyrod Taylor. This offense was just not moving the ball at all. So he was he was definitely a volume play when he had his great weeks. He had um, multiple weeks over 25 carries. He had a week with over 30 carries. So that's just kind of what you got from Saquon. Um, he has said there, you know, if you're going to franchise tag me, franchise tag me. So it'll be interesting. He wants to be back in New York next year. Ty, do you got any other thoughts on, on Saquon? I... 
I don't know how much of it is maybe a step back or whatever it is for Saquon versus, mm-hmm. like you said, just being on a very, very, very poor team yeah. with minimal offensive output. Uh, output. Um, it stinks, though, because you expected a lot from Saquon this year, right? You took mm-hmm. him in the first round of your drafts, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. If it wasn't, yeah, like middle of the first, late first round. Um so that one that one stung a bit. He you know he made it worthwhile a couple of weeks, right? But there were a lot of other weeks where you're left, you know, either pounding the fist on the table for more or scratching your head because something didn't go right when you thought yep. it was supposed to go right. Yeah, and this, you know, it was just all over the place for Saquon. And so and it was, you know, you had like I said, it was either a really good week or it was a week that just really stunk. All right, moving on to there are running back 12 on the year. And Ty, I know you're happy about this. I know you and Lucas are both very, very happy about this. I wasn't out on James Cook, but I wasn't nearly as high as you guys were. James Cook is a running back 12, 237 carries, 12 or 1,122 yards, 4.7 yards per carry. Had Did he only really have two rushing touchdowns in the season? Mm-hmm. Wild. Um, 44 receptions, 54 uh, targets, 445 um Receiving yards, and he did add four receiving touchdowns. Ty, why don't you give us the good, the bad, and the ugly on Jimothy Cook? (laughs) Yeah, Jimothy Cook, like we call him uh, here. Uh, James Cook really took advantage of you know, his opportunity in this Buffalo offense this year. I mean, he was the workhorse back this year. I, I by far the leader in carries and touches out of the backfield, um, you know, on the year out of all running backs, he finished fourth in total rushing yards. He was fifth in yards per touch. And there were a couple of times where we included him in our shorts and our, our TikToks and stuff where I had to talk about James cook. And I, and anytime I was looking at stats for him, you could tell like literally anything he, t- any ball he touched, it turned to gold because yeah. he made things happen. Um, the bad though, for James cook, he might've cost you in fantasy playoffs a little bit. He only averaged six fantasy points from week 16 to 18. And that one was a kind of a brutal break though, because he was coming off of his uh, I'm pretty sure running back one performance where he put up like 36, is it 36 fantasy points? Like yeah. you, you know, that made you feel great going into playoffs or at least going into the next round of playoffs. And then he kind of, you know, kind of crapped the bed because he put a five and five and a half the next two Oof. weeks. So that's the only kind of bad thing we could find about James cook mm-hmm. and the ugly though. I think we all knew this though, going into the season and, you know, it left some, uh, you know, there was maybe some room for, for improvement if things went his way, but the guy just did not get any kind of goal line opportunities. He was out carried by Latavius Murray quite a bit inside the five and inside the 10 as well. Um, so if you knew that or had a feeling that it was not going to be James Cook down in the red zone, and again, you were prepared for that. You felt great about the season that James Cook had. But I th- I think when I look at that, I think it just leaves so much on the table for James Cook. And mm-hmm. not to say that he got bailed out or anything like that. Four receiving touchdowns did make a difference. Yeah. You know, if he's only scoring two, I, I didn't do the math on it. But if he's only scoring two uh, receiving touchdowns, he's then looking at running back 15. So maybe not so much of it, you know, not so much of a difference in that regard, but like you, you, when it comes to running backs, receiving touchdowns are not the stickiest of sticky yeah. stats. So, you know, I, I was thinking about this while I was doing my notes for him. I was like, I'm very interested to see where James cook is going to go in drafts next year mm. because who knows what this Buffalo offense looks like next year. And I was I think I was telling my my mom about this because we were watching the Buffalo Pittsburgh game yesterday. She's like, "What happened to Diggs?" And I was like, "Ah, uh, that's a great question." Yeah. And uh, she's like, well, "He's not going to be too happy about that in the off season." I was like, "You're exactly right." So who knows what this Buffalo offense is going to be like next year? But the encouraging thing is that this backfield belongs to James Cook, and I mm-hmm. just like with Isaiah Pacheco. I don't see a need for Buffalo to go out and go grab another starter, another starting caliber running back to pair up with James Cook. 
Yeah, Sean McDermott is that old school coach who wants a big back in the goal line. And then also, Josh Allen had 15 rushing touchdowns. He tied Jalen Hurts for the all-time quarterback rushing touchdown record this season. And that's not something that's... I mean, obviously, he's not going to get 15 every year. But Josh Allen is a 7-10 to rushing touchdown a year kind of guy as well on top of all that. Um, So touchdowns are just not going to be James Cook thing. I think that's going to keep his ADP low, which will be nice for next season, right? He's not going to all of a sudden be, uh, you know, a second round guy. Um, But it does cap his upside. Mm -hmm. All right. Running back 11, Alvin Kamara. The good, or I'll, I'll give you the stats first real quick. 180, 180 carries, 694 yards, 3.9 yards per, per carry. He didn't have a single run over 20 yards this season. He's the only running back in the top tw- top 15 to not do that. Everybody else except for Joe Mixon had at least 10 of them. Um, five touchdowns, 75 receptions, which was led or second behind only Brees Hall, 86 targets, 466 yards. And he added another touchdown through the year. So only six touchdowns, another low touchdown year for Alan Kamara. Um, but the good, he was running back three in points per game. And he was second in receptions despite only playing 13 games. So if you drafted him, if you took that chance on him being suspended, it paid off. The bad, it was all volume for Kamara this year. I mean, and I'm talking about bad as looking, you know, the outlook um, looking forward. He's had 10 total touchdowns over the last two seasons combined. He was 37th in yards per touch. He was under 4.0 yards, yards per carry um, again. Um, and he had only 6.2 yards per reception, which was two and a half yards lower than any of the last three years. So he's just a guy who was banking on this volume, which is obviously, you know, was great this year. Volume's king of fantasy, but moving forward as he, I mean, he's 28 this year, being 29, 30. It'll be interesting to see if that volume continues. And then the ugly was he kills you in the fantasy playoffs. He did have 16 in the first week, but then 8.5, 6.9. kind of a similar to James Cook we just talked about. Not, not pretty, not really what you wanted. But on the season as a whole, you know, he was always in our conversations for best value, best steal in the draft, just because he was averaging 18 fantasy points per game and was drafted, you know, at the end of the fifth, beginning of the sixth round um, because of his suspension. Yeah, I, Alvin Kamara was, you know, arguably league winner up until mm-hmm. the very end. Just you you knew what you were getting with Alvin Kamara if you took him in your drafts. And, you know, I, I was thinking about this, too, because we talked about him on my YouTube video that we posted last week. So you should check that out. But um, I don't think it has, you know, the reason why he was going so much later in drafts, I don't think it had to do necessarily with the fact that he was suspended three games, although that mattered. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that he's an aging running back after they drafted Kendra Miller in the third round and mm-hmm. signed Jamal Williams to a four year contract. Right. Mm-hmm. So for Alvin Kamara to kind of, you know, burst through those kind of, you know, Potential negatives, I'll, I'll just say it like that. Um, it was great to see. And again, like he got you pretty far into your leagues. Only downside is when it mattered, he didn't really show up. So um, it'll be interesting to see Alvin Kamara going forward, though, because again, now mm-hmm. he is aging even more now. Yeah. And again, the Saints offense is always going to be a question mark because for whatever reason, they, they want to keep their, I don't know the name of the offensive coordinator, but they want to keep the Sean Payton offense where they're using Taysom Hill. They're using, you know, like multiple tight ends, all that kind of stuff. And, and then getting Kamara in receptions and stuff. So it'll be an interesting off season to see what the saints do on offense. And I mean, here's the other thing. There was not a whole lot of happy people with the performance of Derek Carr this year. So no. who knows what the saints will do this off season, but you know, if things stay relatively unchanged, um, Alvin Kamara should be just fine next year then. Yeah, it'd be interesting. He I could ima- I could see him going probably as top 10 running back, probably you know, that Josh Jacob territory, Josh Jacobs territory that we saw this year. Um, which will be interesting because I feel like you're gonna have a lot of people saying, Oh, we look at Alvin Car- or look at Austin Eckler. This is what he did in his running back 20, you know, 28, 29 season. So it'll be interesting to see what you know, the public perception. And then obviously it depends a lot on what this offense looks like. I mean, if they bring in another running back, you know, Jamal Williams didn't really work out. So maybe they bring in someone else. That'll be interesting to see. 
Uh, running back 10 was a guy that a lot of people compared to Alvin Kamara, um, especially the way that they talked about him. And it is Mr. Jameer Gibbs. And I'll be honest, um, when we divvied up this list, I took the odds, Tyler took the evens, and I didn't check who was at each number. So I'm very sad that Tyler gets to talk of the chunk about Jameer Gibbs. But 182 carries, 945 yards, 5.2 yards per carry, added 10 rushing touchdowns, which I know surprised me, and I'm sure it surprised you a little bit that he had double-digit rushing touchdowns. 52 receptions, 71 targets, 316 yards through the air, and he added another score um, receiving. So, Ty, give us the good, the bad, and the ugly on Jameer Gibbs. Um, It's about time that I get to talk about Jameer Gibbs. I was realizing. I've always talked about David Montgomery. I've you never are really... a David Montgomery guy. You have yeah. been cast upon that, put in that box. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, Jameer Gibbs, for a rookie season, he made quite the impact. Uh this year, he was top 10 in receptions and targets and total touchdowns, fantasy points per opportunity, fantasy points per game, target share, routes ran, true yards per carry, yards per touch, breakaway runs. Top 10 in all of those. That's pretty good for a rookie season. And he was a running back four from week seven to the end of the season. So he more than likely was your league winner this year if you yeah. had him on your team. Um the bad though with Jer- with Jameer Gibbs, he looked like a bust the first six weeks of the season. Yeah, right, it was it was very scary, and it didn't help that he missed two games. But in yeah. the first four games, it wasn't great either. He was he averaged nine and a half fantasy points per game, and that for a third round pick, th- that's what you had to pay for Jameer Gibbs. That's not what you were hoping for at the beginning of the season. Um, but again, he turned it around because after he came back from his injury, he was running back four the rest of the way, but. Um, I think the thing that we do need to talk about more with Jameer Gibbs, at least going into next season, is the amount of, uh, you know, what what's the opportunity going to look like for him next year? Because this year he was 34th in opportunity share and he was 28th in carry. So it's not like the worst, but mm-hmm. when you think about it like this, he was 28th in carries despite being on the team that ran the ball the seventh most times per game, right? So in some ways, like, that makes me happy because that tells me like, Hey, David Montgomery is still getting carries and stuff in this offense. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think the conversation then going into next year, like I said, is what's the opportunity going to be like for him next year, right? You're going into your sophomore season, but David Montgomery is still there. And who knows what happens with Ben Johnson. Does Detroit want to continue running the ball as much as they do? Do they want to rely on Jared Goff a little bit more? Like, Jameer Gibbs is going to be the most fascinating player to watch for at least the running backs, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. just because there are there are so many different variables that will get switched, could stay the same, get flipped on their head completely like, you know, it'll it'll be a very interesting watch to see what happens with Detroit and specifically Jameer Gibbs. But but in terms of this season, you know. it, It was scary at first, but all the hype that you know, went with Jameer Gibbs finally paid off in the second half of the season. Yeah. And the more I've thought about throughout the season, right. A lot of it, and I even talked about it comparing Alvin Kamara and Mark, Mark Ingram to David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs this season. And the more I watched it, the more I thought about it, I feel like it's closer to last year's Zeke and Tony Pollard than Mm -hmm. it is to that one. Um, Because Jameer Gibbs did not see, you know, a hot, almost uh, 85 plus targets, right? He was right around 70. You know, obviously that could expand a little bit, but it's the efficiency on the ground. It's the fact that they used him in the red zone too. Um, yep. It was, wasn't was just, you know, David Montgomery. If it was inside the five yard line, it was 100% David Montgomery. And, you know, that's the way they're going to run it. Um, actually, I shouldn't say 100% David Montgomery because there was a couple games where you were like, why is Gibbs running? Okay, I guess Gibbs is running here. And I know you <laughs> were a little frustrated at that. Um, at times, but it was it was really good to see. Um, but obviously, it'll be interesting if you know he's a top if he's taken as a top six back next year. Mm-hmm. Is that going to be a little too steep to be fully in on Jameer Gibbs? Is it not? So um, it, it'll be something to look forward to next year. I, I'll say this though with Jameer Gibbs, he he's put himself in the territory where, like, let's say he is going as a top six running back or a top eight running back next year. It's not necessarily that you, you know, it's not necessarily that you think that he'll bust. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of like, I just like better values after that, if that makes sense. So it's not mm-hmm. like the ultimate, like pessimistic 
you know, yeah. opinion that you'd have about Jameer Gibbs. Like you'll, you know, that Jameer Gibbs will be good. But then again, like I said, like there is so much that could change in Detroit after this season that it yep. is going to be one that you're that we're at least we are going to be paying very close attention to. Yeah, and we've mentioned it before. Ben Johnson leaving could be huge for them uh, if he is gone. So, you know, that, that'll just be it'll be a lot to watch. I'm probably still going to be in on him next year, even if I, you know, even yeah. if his price is a little steeper just because he is that good. Like you said, week running back four, week seven through end of the season and. We talk, I mean, we've looked at this list so far, right? We've talked about Saquon, Alan Kamara, um, even Tony Pollard's going to be 27 years old. We got Derek Henry on this list, Raheem Mostert, Joe Mixon, um, even Christian McCaffrey. These are all going to be aging, older running backs next season. So it's, it's going to be interesting. I mean, we're really turning the page on that new, you know, incoming, up and coming running backs. We're talking about in new up and coming running back, we got B. John Robinson. Who's a running back nine, which does feel surprising because it felt like we were so negative about Bijan all season long. I mean, and a lot of that comes from where you drafted him, man. A lot of that comes from the fact that the good is the advanced numbers were great on him. Fifth in yards created, ninth in yards per touch, first in routes run, eighth in yards per reception, seventh in invaded tackles, third in target share, and fourth in receiving yards. When the ball was in his hand, he was amazing. I mean, he, he was spectacular with the ball in his hand. Um, but the problem was, I'm going to I'm gonna skip to the ugly and then I'll come back to the bad because they just go together. The problem was he was 31st in opportunity share. He only had 52% of the opportunity share. You're an eighth overall pick and you're that good with the ball in your hand and you have a 52, 52% overall opportunity share. And he only was 19th in carries with only 214 of them. Yeah, he was, you know, what did I say? Third in target share, you know, fourth in receiving yards. So he got the ball through the air. But we were hoping for that rookie year Saquon Barkley, 270 plus carries. We got 214 because Tyler Algier was sitting around 150 plus. Cordero Patterson was getting involved in the running game and he was 32nd in red zone touches. That hurts. Eight total touchdowns in the air, four on the ground, four through the air. Um, but he only had 31 red zone touches. And the bad, he, bounced, he probably bounced you out of the playoffs. As your running back one, because that first week, the playoffs against Carolina, he had seven attempts for 11 yards and a fumble for 0.4 points. That hurts. That hurts a lot. If you're, you know, your running back one drops you 0.4. I will say why well, I, I said this a stat all off season since 2016 running backs drafted in the top 12 finishes top 10 running backs that has continued. Um, both Jameer Gibbs and Bijan Robinson finish as top 12 backs. So you know, if the, the draft capital does matter for running backs, um, obviously Bijan was taken a little too high. Um, but I think, you know, looking at next year, no Arthur Smith, there's a lot to be excited about for Bijan Robinson. Where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start with the speculative side of this because the, the, the speculative future of the Atlanta Falcons, because apparently, 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 Atlanta and Bill Belichick have some kind of mutual interest in each other. Yeah. And I cannot wrap my head around if that's a good thing or a bad thing, specifically for the Falcons offense. Yeah. Because you you have to put aside like all the Brady years with Belichick, but you can't just like completely throw them out. So you're like, well, okay. Bill Belichick would then have Taylor Heineke and Desmond Ritter. Maybe they trade for Fields. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't feel like it would solve anything with the Falcons offense that they brought in Bill Belichick, mm -hmm. but that might just be me, but back to this season for Bijan. Um, yeah. Arthur, maybe in, maybe you got fired because you just refuse to use your best players. And instead you try to rely on guys like John U. Smith and Cadero Hodge and, uh, Cordero Patterson. Yeah. Like <laughs> the thing is like, I don't think I've ever seen, a coach just looked the other way so many other times and survived the job. Like it just does not work like that. So, you know, at the moment we can be very, very, I don't want to say happy because I don't want to sound like I'm 
you know, <laughs> somebody lost their job. Okay. It's not a good thing. Um, but we can rejoice a little bit that like Bijan Robinson might actually just be let loose next year. Um, I just hope he doesn't go too high in drafts that like people are like, Oh, no more authors. So it's like for sure. Top three running back. And you're like, yeah. no, that's not how it's supposed to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All righty. We're going to take a quick break and hear from our friends over at underdog fantasy before we get on to the top eight running backs from 2023. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Now, we love Underdog. It is the easiest place to play best ball formats, and they even have their own form of player props called Pick'em. You can make up to 20 times your money on a single night by correlating props together. Two picks will triple your money, three will six times it, four will ten times it, and five plays that all hit will multiply your entry by 20. You can even place insurance on your picks too, so if only four of your five props hit, you still get ten times your entry. And if you use our code FELLAS when signing up, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100. And we're back and we're going to talk number eight, Mr. Derek Henry on the season led this led in um, attempts again, 280 attempts, six, 1167 yards, 4.2 yards per carry had another 12 touchdowns, 28 receptions, 36 targets, 214 yards and zero tutty uh, receiving touchdowns on there. He is actually our only top 12 back without a receiving touchdown. Mm. All right, Ty, take it away. Talk, talk to us about Derrick Henry. Um, the uh, the king was um not the king this year. No. Um, you know, he looked mortal. He looked mortal. <laughs> um, you know, th- there were still some positives from this year. You know, he he finished with double digit touchdowns for the sixth straight season. Which is he also said he also had. Double digit carries in every game. So there was rarely a time, you know, you know, you had like a 10 carry, 11 carry game where you're like, well, that's not the Derrick Henry that I'm used to. But mm-hmm. more times than not, like he was still the Derrick Henry of old. Um, I think for the first time, though, in quite some time, we saw a v- wildly inconsistent Derrick Henry. And that wasn't, mm-hmm. I really don't think it was any fault of his own. We, you know, we noticed right away at the beginning of the season that their offense really, really takes, you know, abandons any kind of game plan with Derrick Henry in it when they get down early and get down big. Mm-hmm. It very much became a Ty J Spears kind of game dominated by snap share, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you saw some more inconsistency with some really, really low floors. Um, I think he had like three games, maybe four games with like, three fantasy points like it or less like it was it was really really low um and he only had three games on the year with 100 or more rushing yards that was definitely different that is not where we're used to um but the see i i had this down isn't ugly but we're talking about the running back eight on the year so i don't know how ugly this really is but Mm -hmm. derrick henry had the lowest rushing attempts rushing yards and snap share in a full season since 28, I say full season because he only played half of 2021. So, um, but you know, the lowest amount of rushing attempts, yards and snap share. Since 2018. Um, we know that Derrick Henry is on his way out of Tennessee. You know, he said his mm-hmm. hands after their last game. So who knows what happens with him, where he goes. Um, the other part of this too is, I'm fascinated to see what his, you know, what his market value is going to be with an aging running back like Derrick Henry with the amount of miles that he has. Yet, you know, and and uh, all in all, we are talking about the running back on the year. So, despite the fact of having the lowest, you know, some really bad games, some really low no- or say low enough, really low numbers, lower numbers than usual. He still finishes a top eight running back on the year. So um, Derrick Henry, like you said, wasn't the king like you expected. I think a lot of people were prepared for it. Um, a lot of people were, I shouldn't say praying on his downfall. There were a lot of people that were like, I'm not touching Derrick Henry with an eight foot pole. And you're like, oh, well, yeah, 
you you should still have some interest in Derrick Henry, but it'll be interesting moving forward now with a 31 year old Derrick Henry. Yeah, it is. It is crazy that, you know, lowest rush attempts in 2018. He leads the league with 280 still um, rushing yards. The lowest he's second in the league touchdowns. He's still top five. You know, I mean, it's just, it's crazy numbers. But from a fancy perspective, right, as you said, it was very inconsistent versus what we were used to. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens moving forward with him not in Tennessee, with him being, you know, close, knocking on the door of 30, I think, next year. Um, how, how do teams use him? Is he just going to be like a goal line back moving forward? You know, is he going to be a, like an Ezekiel Elliott role for the, pay, you know, something like that. It'll be interesting to see what teams do with him. Moving on to running back seven is a guy that nobody that would be up this high. And it's Mr. Kyron Williams, 228 attempts, 1144 yards, five yards per carry, 12 touchdowns, 32 receptions, 48 targets, 206 receiving yards and three touchdowns. All in 12 games. He was third in rushing yards and touchdowns, like I said, despite only playing 12 games. And he was the only player other than CMC to average more than 18 points per game as a running back. And he had 21.3. A wild year from Kyron Williams. If you were like me, you were very happy in the first half of the year. He was a guy I added in almost every league except for a redraft league. So I was very excited. He got hurt. That's really his only downfall. His really only ugly is that he got hurt and missed four weeks i then sold him at the end of the four weeks and like there's no way he keeps this up and then he was probably your league winner if you had him on your team because he was amazing down the stretch his only bad thing was that he had single digit ppr games in weeks three and five and then he missed four games other than that the dude was phenomenal like there's there's nothing more you can say like negative about him he got the touchdowns he got the carries he was using the receiving game it was when Cooper Cup wasn't there. Is when Puka, you know, Cooper Cup was there. Is when Puka was going off. It's when both were going off. It didn't matter. Kyron Williams was legit, you know, throughout the entire season. The only real question is, what does this mean for next year? And I would be shocked after what we saw this year: five yards per carry, dominating. If they bring in another guy who's truly going to challenge Kyron for the you know, running back one spot. I, I could definitely see them bringing him in another guy to kind of share some of the workload, right? He's he's a smaller back. He's like 5'9", one, 195. Um, you know, he got hurt this season. So I could see bringing him someone to spell, you know, some of that a little bit. But, man, I mean, people are talking about, I want to take Kyron with my, you know, a top five pick next season. That, that That's where we're at with Kyron Williamson. It's hard to blame him after what we saw this year. Yeah, I uh, running back two in fantasy points per game on the year. Like the running back seven is kind of a facade, right? Yeah. Like the guy was absolutely phenomenal. You do wonder going into next year, though, do they bring in a bigger back for mm-hmm. the goal line? Does he lose out on the on the you know goal line touches and opportunities? But at the same time, after what we saw this year why would you try to change that up? Mm -hmm. Right? Like you, there's Kyron was exactly what Sean McVay has been asking for and wanting out of his running backs ever since Todd Gurley really hit his decline, right? Like why change that up? And so, you know, I, I understand where some people are coming from when they say like, yeah, I want him. I'll take him as a top five pick next year. I get it. Um, we are way too early to be saying that though. Yeah. There are so many things that can change, but the guy was incredible this year and you got to yeah. give him his flowers. Yeah. Let me ask you a quick dynasty question. Kyron, is he a buy? Is he a sell or is he a hold? I think he's a hold. That's kind of where I am. Because unless, unless it's crazy value either way. I think it's a hold. The thing, yeah, like I think if everyone's got a price in dynasty, yeah. like we we need to stop saying that like, this guy's untouchable, Lucas. That goes out to you. If you're getting five first round picks for Jamar Chase, you hit accept. Okay, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the th- first yeah. one did us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's there's some yeah there's some personal skin in that one, but everyone has a price in dynasty. So maybe there's a price that you can get, but it's a matter of like, do you find someone that can actually like pay up for it and stuff? And the thing is too, like there's, we want to think of Kyron Williams as a guarantee 
there are no guarantees now as we go into the off season with really any player besides like if your name is Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson and stuff. So I would say hold just because you really don't know what could happen. Yeah, no, I'd agree. All right, let's move on to running back six. Mr. Joe Mixon. He just doesn't go away. He's I'm kind of like a cockroach. You can't get rid of him. Um, he is <laughs> 257 carries, 1,034 yards, four yards per carry, nine tutties on the season, had another 52 receptions on 64 targets for 376 yards and another three touchdowns, 15.7 fantasy points per game. I said this um, in our, our TikTok video. I got coming out. Oh, actually, you guys will hear this before the video. Only running back over the last three seasons finished top 10 in each year. This dude, like I said, he just doesn't go away. Um, so, Ty, why don't you give us the good, the bad, and the ugly on Mr. Joe Mixon? Um, yeah, Joe Mixon. Yeah, he's he doesn't go away. He will never go away, I guess. <laughs> um, he was a running back four from week eight until the end of the season. He was third in opportunity share and third in red zone touches. And you knew you 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 knew what Joe Mixon was going to be going into the season. And I'm I can't tell if it's more so. I mean, you could look at fantasy points per game and be like, well, you know, because my question is like, well, does he is he only the running back six just because there are other running backs that you know either hit an unlucky injury spell and stuff like that? But um Joe Mixon is going to give you like 220 carries a year. He's going to give you about 50 receptions and he's going to find the end zone about 10, 11 times. Yep. Now the question is yardage and stuff, which leads me into the bad because the guy, the guy (laughs) just for a while, (laughs) the guy does not improve on efficiency. He is a steady, like 3.8 to four yards per carry. Like he finished with four this year. Um, and he's only going to give you about six and a half to seven receiving yards, like or, or yards per reception. So it's like the guy just does. There's no efficiency to his game. No, what's there the <laughs> But the thing is, he keeps scoring. So it doesn't really mm-hmm. matter. It doesn't really matter. So, um, you, you know, if we're ever going to get into the argument of touch, you know, touchdown dependent and all that kind of stuff, like, you know. Because I I still hold a grudge over Dawson Knox being called <laughs> touchdown dependent. Um, Joe Mixon is I I think we have to stop saying that Joe Mixon is touchdown dependent and just accept the fact that he is. Like <laughs> we can't argue it anymore. He just is yeah. okay. And uh, with all that being said, there's not really an ugly with Joe Mixon. Like yeah. he's exactly what you thought he was going to be. Yeah, and I, and maybe a, uh, probably a little bit better. But yeah, I mean he was. The type of player he thought he was gonna be. Yeah. The thing with Joe Mixon for moving on for next year is he is technically under contract, but the Bengals could cut him and save about six and a half million dollars. So mm-hmm. and he would be only about two point seven in dead cap. Um, that doesn't mean that they couldn't, you know, re- restructure his contract, keep him there, and or just extend keep, him or extend him. Um, you know, kick the money down the road a little bit. He'll be. Let's see. What is he right now? I think he's 27. Yeah, he'll be 28 at the beginning of the next year. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. Obviously, I mean, if he's in the same role again, he's going to give you the same thing. You know, it's not like we're worried about Mixon losing a step or something like that, right? He's yep. two two steps through the hole, fall forward. Two steps through the hole, fall forward. I mean, and then catch catch a couple dump offs here and there. That's that's who he is, um, and that's what he has been. So. Yeah, I would agree. I think that's just who he is moving forward. Running back five, another surprise here. We have Raheem Mostert, um, who had a pretty good season. 209 carries, 1,000 yards on the ground, 4.8 yards per carry, 18 rushing touchdowns, had another 25 receptions on 32 targets for 175 yards, and another three touchdowns, 21 total touchdowns tied for the league lead. Um, So obviously, you know, he was second in touch or he was tied for first in touchdowns, fourth in fantasy points per game, all would be in drafting the 11th round. Like, like Kyron Williams, you know, there really anything I say after this is just nitpicking just to mm. feel out of bad and ugly. Um, the bad he was out during championship week. That hurts. You know, you're, you want it. You want to have him on there. Ooh, Ty, do we got some breaking news? <laughs> what do we got? Hit the button, hit the button for breaking news. Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> 
know how I would say that the, you don't know what the Saints are going to do because of all their pieces and stuff. They fired their offensive coordinator. They were listening, Ty. They, they were, were listening. listening. So Alvin Kamara is no longer a top 10 fantasy running back because they're going to bring in an offensive coordinator like Arthur Smith is just absolutely going to ruin Alvin Kamara. So <laughs> say goodbye. Send your well wishes to Alvin Kamara because we are not going to see the same Alvin Kamara next year. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll, be, it'll definitely be interesting Jeez. something to watch. That is funny that you were just talking about him. <laughs> um, all right, our ship backs. This Ty's losing his stuff over there. Um, the you. ugly for most, and like I said, this is very nitpicky, is the fact he only had 20, and this is more of an outlook for next year, is the fact he only had 20 more touches and 100 more yards than he did last year. The difference was the 16 touchdowns. So 16 touchdowns, you know, 21 touchdowns a year doesn't feel sticky. That doesn't feel like something that's going to carry over. He's going to be 32 next year. So, I mean, I don't want to bet against him. I bet against him all year this year and was wrong every single week. But, um, but yeah, Ty, I, I know you didn't listen to a word I said. So <laughs> anything else to add on the Saints situation that we just, that we just heard about? Well, so it, rap, she yep. literally put it into words. The Saints are changing their offense for the first time since 2009. Like that's wild. That's wild. Um, no, with I, I will say this though about Raheem Mostert. Like Miami kind of showed their hand. I don't know, moving. I you know, I want to say moving forward at least that when they get into the red zone, they do want to run it in. Yeah. Like that that is and in and, and the other thing too, like Mike McDaniel was a you know a wide receiver kind of guru before becoming the head coach. So that's why they went out and got a Tyree Kill. Mm-hmm. And that's why we're seeing Jalen Waddle, you know become one of the really, you know, really, really, um, really good wide receiver twos that really could be a wide receiver one for any other team. But, mm. um, the dolphins will want to run the ball in that's, that's their MO when they get towards the goal line. Um, so, you know, you've got Devon a Chan. I think they'll still have Jeff Wilson too. So it's really the same backfield. Maybe there's some different, you know, shifting in responsibilities and stuff, but um, I'm in, I've, I've said this for almost every player. I'm interested to see how people are going to be Raheem most are going to next year as a 32 year old mm-hmm. running back with his injury history on this Miami dolphins team. So yeah, yeah with Devon HN as well, you know, I mean, there's just gonna be a lot of factors. I would be shocked if he's, you know, higher than like a round eight running back going into next year. All right. Running back four, Rashad white on the season, 272 carries crazy 272 carries in the man. Didn't even have a thousand yards rushing 990 yards rushing 3.6 yards per attempt had six touchdowns, 64 receptions, 70 targets, 549 yards to the air though. And had another three touchdowns through the air. So Ty, why don't you give us the good, the bad and the ugly for Rashad white. <laughs> This might this will start off as a bad, but I'll get it back to the good. Uh, if you if you thought that Joe Mixon was one of the most inefficient running backs, let me introduce you to Rashad White. Again, <laughs> just you can't play running backs in general. <laughs> in general, I mean, you said it: two hundred and seventy carries, and he couldn't crack a thousand yards. Right? Part of that I have to think is offensive line a mm-hmm, little bit. Definitely too. not always on a running back, but. Um, Gosh, yeah. If you ever need a definition of inefficient, I'll introduce you to Rashad White. But despite the inefficiency, um, running back four on the year, he was running back 10 defense points per game. So that's probably a little more accurate than a running back four. Um, but the fact is that Rashad White was the running back three from week six to the end of the season, and he was <clears throat> A workhorse. Yes. Bell cow back. He was second in carries. He was fourth in receptions. Um, this offense was really built on the run, and uh Rashad White made the most of it. Um, you know, the only negatives I could really come up with for Rashad White were was that he was he had a really slow start to the season. He was the running back 25 for the first five weeks, and that that did include their bye week. So it's you know probably a little bit higher than running back 25 because he literally has a game with zero points that he didn't even play in. But um, the thing is though, back to this inefficiency, he was 57th in true yards per carry. Like Mm -hmm. the guy just, it was not efficient, but the thing with inefficiency is, you know, if you're getting touches, 
inefficiency, the the impact of inefficiency goes down, right? Yeah. So that's why we've seen like a Joe Mixon, right? We've seen, um, I mean, Derek Henry, right? Fresh like this, yeah. Like they they continue to be solid fantasy option because they just get so many touches, right? And it yeah. helps you know, when you, when you think Joe Mixon and Rashad White, it's because they're involved in the receiving game too, right? So they're scoring. Yeah. But also getting involved in the receiving game. Um, this Tampa offense, or you know, exceeded all expectations. Um, so I'm curious to see how people uh, rank in pre- Tampa offense next year. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was just saying too. Dave Canales could be a very intriguing head coaching option for a team. Um, like Seattle, because that's where he was, and maybe that helps you know Gino get back to where he was a year ago. But um, yeah, Rashad White, I you know, as long as they're not going to bring in another back, I really don't see the need to because again, the guy is like your proto. I shouldn't say prototypical, but like you want your modern day look, your modern day running back to be Rashad White, who's yeah. got the size that can just really power through people that can get north that can run downhill, but he can also go, you know, east and west and he can, you know, break some tackles and be involved in the receiving game. But um, Rashad White, probably one of the surprises of the season, to be completely honest, because yeah. again, this whole offense was a surprise. But um, yeah, Rashad White is, he's really good at the football. I'll say that good he's really football. good. He's good at the football. Yeah. Yeah. And, I'm just going to transition to a running the next guy because he's pretty similar actually from just volume, low efficiency, put up fantasy points. That's Travis Etienne. Um, on the season, Etienne had 267 carries, 1,008 yards, 3.8 yards per carry. He did have 11 touchdowns on the ground, um, 58 receptions, 73 targets, 476 yards in a tutty. Right, very similar to Rashad White in totals actually. Um, fourth in carries, he was sixth. This is the he. For the good, he was a volume hog with fourth and carry, six in receptions and six in touchdowns. Right? He got the ball a ton. The bad was his yards from carry went from 5.1 last season to 3.8 this year. And he ran for 113 less yards on 47 more carries, which is a crazy stat to me. <laughs> that uh, he, you know, his yards went down on almost 50 more carries, almost three more a game. Um, but yeah, he was he was very similar to Rashad White from the aspect of this team's going to feed him the ball. He's just inefficient with it. Both, you know, they could break away for some decent sized runs. Both were involved in the passing game. But the ugly for Travis Etienne as well, Rashad White was great down the stretch. Down the stretch for Etienne, he had as much single point or single digit games as double digit games over his last eight. So it was it was like he's great. He's bad. He's great. He's bad. He's great. He's bad. He's great. He's bad over his last eight games. And he, before that, before the buy, he had four straight top five finishes, which was awesome. You know, he, that's right. When I traded for him, I traded high on Travis Etienne in our dynasty league um, because I felt like I could. Um, and you know, it didn't really pay off at the end of the year. And he does feel like a Rashad white esque for this next year. It doesn't feel like either of them are going to be replaced. It feels like they're going to kind of be in a similar spot and it feels like volume's probably going to be very similar again. It's just going to come down to if efficiency comes up at all, they could be great for fantasy. And if they see the same volume, you're still probably going to be pretty stinking happy with both of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My tank bigs me heart is deeply saddened by everything that happened this year with, Jacksonville's backfield. Um, it makes me sad to say that he is not going to be a factor going into next year. This backfield is going to be Travis Etienne's. Mm-hmm. Um, they really need to get a run game sorted out, though. I think yeah. they they suffered from a lack of it. And when I say lack of it, I just think like <laughs> this offense, I should just generalize it. The offense needs to be better going into yes. next year. Um, I do trust Doug Peterson. I still have faith in Trevor Lawrence. Let's talk about is Trevor Lawrence a franchise quarterback or not? Baloney. He is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just get him an off season where he's fully healthy. Get ETN. I have to think that ETN was battling some kind of injury this season too. I, they needed an off season. And I think they, you know, 
going into next year, they will still be one, I, one of my highest drafted offenses because I think there's too much firepower, including Travis Etienne, um, to not be a, a force to reckon with. Yeah, for sure. All righty, let's move on to running back two. The guy I was wrong on this year. I thought he was going to take more time to come back from the injury, but he proved that he is one of the top backs in the NFL, Mr. Brees Hall, 223 carries, 994 yards, 4.5 yards per carry, five touchdowns, 76 receptions, league leading, 95 targets, league leading, 591 receiving yards, league leading, um, and four touchdowns, uh, 17.1 fantasy points per game. Tyler, give us the good, give us the bad, and give us the ugly on Brees Hall. Sorry if I stole any of that for you. I, I know you wanted to talk about Brees so I bad. I did. I know. That's what I mean. I wanted Brees. I wanted Gibbs, and I took the wrong set. And it's my fault too. I <laughs> I took it. I told Ty what we were doing. So this is all on me. <laughs> That's your fault. Um, no, Brees Hall um, was special this year. Um, you know, he, he took the first four games. I, I should say it was the first four games where they're kind of ramping him back up, making sure that he was okay. Um, so then from week five to the end of the season, when he got the full workload, he was a running back too. like dude was un unbelievable. He had six games with nine or more targets. He was first in targets, receiving yards, receptions, evaded tackles. He was top five and weighted opportunity target share routes and yards created. Um, this offense went through Reese hall and, um, it didn't exactly turn into wins, but the, you know, it made people say at the end of the season, like imagine what Bruce Hall would be like if they had Aaron Rodgers. And it's like, okay, I get what you're trying to say. That's not how it works, but like, yeah. I get what you're saying. Um, <clears throat> the only bad really for Brees wasn't even really like his own fault. I think like, mm-hmm. you know, running back 32 in weeks one through four, right. When he wasn't getting the full workload with two games getting back. Yeah. Right. Under, under four fancy points. And I just have to think that that's more so like the offense is trying to figure out what to do now with no more Rogers. Yep. Um, and the other part too, he had the fourth most stuffed runs this year. That's not his fault, like whatsoever. Mm. That's an offensive line breaking down and letting defensive tackles or linebackers like get through to get to Brees Hall. But um, you you added this before we started. The ugly, uh, he didn't rush for over fifty yards in a single game once from week six to fifteen. Um, so not the most like ideal stat line from a rushing perspective, but he, he made up for it in the receiving game and. Uh, We've talked so much on this on on our channel just about how running back receptions need to have a bigger premium on on those players just because it's kind of like rushing touchdowns for a quarterback. They're just a cheat code. Um, Brees, I don't know what else I can say that's you know that hasn't been said about Brees and how good he was this season, but. Um, there's there should be a lot of excitement with Brees and then Aaron Rodgers coming back for this Jets offense next year. Yeah, it's crazy too. You talk about this stretch. He was top twelve, um, one, two, four times during this stretch. Top ten three times. Only had one finish outside the top thirty. Was top twenty four all but two two games during that stretch. So, I mean, the dude was. I mean, not getting it down the ground, but you know, getting it done through the air. Um, and that 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 is who Brees is. And then we have running back number one. And like I said, we're not going to spend much time on this guy because we all know he's special. The only reason you wouldn't have drafted him if you were scared he was going to get hurt. But it's Chris McCaffrey, 272 attempts, 1,459 yards, which I believe is at l- almost 300 yards more than the next closest. P- or no, yeah, 300 yards more than the next closest guy. 5.4 yards per attempt. Um, that's second to only Devon Achan on the season. Um, 14 rushing touchdowns, 67 receptions, 83 targets, 564 yards through the air and seven touchdowns, 24.5 fantasy points. The good, he was first in yards, yards per carry touchdowns and fantasy points. He had a hundred point gap between him and the next guy. A hundred point. Let me put this into perspective for you. He was closer to Brees Hall than Brees Hall was. To Gus Edwards, or Brees Hall was closer to Gus Edwards than he was to Christian McCaffrey. Um, 
our running back 10 or running back 10 Jameer Gibbs he was close Jameer Gibbs was closer to Zach Charbonnet than he was to Christian McCaffrey so I mean that gap is ridiculous he was also top three in receptions receiving yards and attempts and the only bad the only bad thing you can say about Christian McCaffrey is he got hurt week 17 and put up his lowest points of the week of the year at 13.1 fantasy points 13.1 was his lowest, and he only played half the game. He had two other games with 13 and 14. Everything else was 19 plus on the season. Wild from this guy. That that's that's your positional advantage that you were looking for this year. <laughs> is there is there anyone else this next season that's gonna that should even be in the conversation for the one on one? No. Honestly. Just with the gap he put on the rest, like we said, a hundred point gap between him and the next running back. Like you would, you would think, like, oh, well, what about Jefferson? What about Jamar Chase? Uh, name me a running back yeah. that he that can do what Christian McCaffrey does. I know. Maybe Brees, maybe, but he's not an you offense like Christian McCaffrey is. No, can't like Brees is the one hundred five. The yeah, 105. Exactly. Yeah, I think. And like you said, like, I think Jefferson, I think Chase, I think Tyreek, I think CD could all put up the same amount of points. As oh, I forgot about CD. Oh, they, they all could put up the same amount of points. But the fact is, there's four wide receivers. There are only one running back in that conversation. Right. right. So you'd go positional advantage. And they showed this year. Oh, uh, you were like, oh, we want to take the safe pick. We don't want to have an injury. Well, Christian McCaffrey played every single game. Jefferson missed time. Jamar Chase had a backup quarterback. Right. And so. There is no safe pick in fantasy football. There's no safe right. pick, and there's uh, if you're scared about injuries, sorry, you shouldn't just you shouldn't play fantasy football. Yeah. Like, because any player can get hurt on any given Sunday. Yeah, it's it is wild. All righty, well that wraps up our episode of the top 15 running backs. Next week we got top 15 wide receivers, then we're gonna do top quarterbacks, and we're gonna do top tight ends, the good, the bad, and the ugly for each of them moving forward. Ty, before we head out is there anything else you want to add for the people hey it's uh it's draft season people <laughs> it is draft season so uh if you if you like the nfl draft if you like dynasty because that's how you know it coincides um you should subscribe you should you should uh even even if you're sick of football right and you need a little bit of a break i get it i get it i get it but still subscribe so you can find us that way and you can find us a lot easier that way too yeah for sure Alrighty, well that does it for us um if you missed it i put out a video ranking our top rookie wide receivers yesterday we'll have top rookie running backs come out next week but well we have the wider top 15 wide receivers we got to kind of crisscross our wires a little bit um yeah well, then we got short form content coming every single day so hit that subscribe button Turn on those notifications. If you're on the audio podcast, thank you for listening. Hit that subscribe button over there. Leave us a nice little review. Well, that is all we got for today. We will see you guys later and deuces. Deuces.